Muy buenas tardes tengan todos ustedes. Good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to our Mexican Embassy, to this event that is uh, very important for us, the Mexican Science Day, El Día de la Ciencia Mexicana. And I will ask our ambassador to give us the greetings. Señor embajador, por favor. Muchas gracias, doctora. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas todas, dear friends, esteemed guests, dear friend, dear friend. Um, both here, present with us at the, in Berlin, at the Embassy of Mexico, or virtually through our social networks. Welcome, welcome to the sixth edition of the Mexican Science Day taking place within the Berlin Science Week. We are here because we believe in science and cooperation. We believe that only working together we will achieve the innovation needed to gain and sustain our competitiveness in international markets. Moreover, we believe that innovation is key to effectively address the many challenges of our times, including, of course, sustainable production and consumption, but also more inclusive and fair social arrangements. Because of that is that this year we focus on three main topics. First, robotics in medicine. Second, startups, more specifically, how to translate scientific ideas into viable business models. And third, alternative social futures. We have with us today experts from both Mexico and Germany, including the Munster School of Business, uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey, the Berliner Hochschule für Technik, BHT, the Freie Universität Berlin, VUB, the Latin American Institute, and Colegio de México. We acknowledge the support of this organization plus the German Research Foundation, DEFGE, to today's dialogue and to the projects presented today, but that run over several years. Special thanks to our panelists and guests that make great effort to be here today. We know how scarce and valuable your time is, and especially your headspace is. Thank you for being here with us. A special thanks to our very own Dr. Julieta Rojo for making this possible, the team of the embassy on a very busy month, and best wishes for all of you for a productive and pleasant uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, now I would like to, to start with the first speaker. Uh, we want to join this topic from science to startups. And I have to, the pleasure to welcome Doctora, Dr. Sue Rosano Rivero. She is uh, studied a lot of things until she became the degree of doctor, cooperative doctoral program of the Munster University of Applied Sciences. Dr. Rosano Rivero is now managing director of science to business marketing research center. She is an expert on entrepreneurship, social and rural entrepreneurship, female entrepreneurship and leadership the role of higher education on entrepreneurship, university business cooperation for entrepreneur, education and entrepreneurial ecosystems and networks. Her research has approached to the topic of entrepreneurship from networking perspective, always focusing on social value creation in addition to economic value creation. Dr. Rosano Rivero is passionate about entrepreneurship, as we heard this word about 
100 times, and creating value for fostering interaction between science, business, and society. Uh, her lecture today, it's about developments in academic entrepreneurship, fostering women's entrepreneurship at the university. You have the floor. Check. Okay. So, um, do I sit down? Do I stand? Stand up? What's better for sitting down? Up or down? I'm, I receive many signers from. Okay, then I can stand up. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Sur Rosano. And uh, today I want to talk about uh, developments in academic entrepreneurship, especially how these topics have developed when it comes to fostering women's entrepreneurship at universities. So as uh, you already heard, I come from the Science to Business Marketing Research Center. And I want to mention something here. This center was founded since more than 20 years ago. What happened? At that time, the narrative around academic entrepreneurship was with an emphasis on patents, licenses. And at that time, the university in Münster, Münster University of Applied Sciences said, we actually see our university pushing too much, pushing technologies, pushing academics to behave like entrepreneurs, pushing identities, why don't we apply principles of marketing, principles of listening to users, listening to our customers, establishing relationships to share knowledge? And that is the origins of the Science to Business Marketing Research Center that I am leading currently with a team of about 30 people. In, we have 10 uh, PhDs, research associates and so on. So when it comes to academic entrepreneurship, 20 years ago we were talking about patents, licenses, technology transfer offices, but today we still hear a lot of that. Nothing wrong, there is a lot of value when somebody can have a scientific finding, then use a startup or a company as a transfer mechanism to innovate. That's great. What we don't see in this narrow conception of academic entrepreneurship is what happens? How can we foster that? Especially if we're talking about academics at the university, what happens with these academics that are not in the technological fields? The social sciences, creative industries, they, not, they don't patent but they still have a lot to give to the society to innovate. Hence, it was important for us to understand another narrative that was more inclusive for other academics and for other activities that offer value. In our studies in 2012 and in 2017, we carried the largest study on university business cooperation for Europe. There is the QR code and you can scan it, you can download our studies per countries and across Europe. And we found that academics actually transfer and share knowledge in many ways, not only through startups, 
but they actually did a lot of these activities with business, across the education mission, across research, but also in management. We also saw that universities were cooperating with business also to foster startups or academic companies, uh, student startups, and so on and so forth. They were cooperating for entrepreneurship. Hence, we look at it from a different perspective. We published this research in 2016 to understand, does it really matter to cooperate with business to foster academic entrepreneurship? So I want to go closer to the bottom of this model. And we learn a lot about academic entrepreneurship and university business cooperation. But most importantly, we learned, number one, that context matters. Even though we see that the barriers and the drivers for this cooperation can help us to explain the extent of development of academic entrepreneurship, it varies across Europe. We took data from representative countries, from representative regions in Europe, and we see that these models are very different. Even in Poland, for example, our model didn't work at all. What it means is that we really need to understand more the nature of academic entrepreneurship in different regions. We also learn that it is very important to understand the motivations from academics to engage in this cooperation that might help to foster academic entrepreneurship. If you see the data from Germany, for example, if I call your attention to the bottom part, we saw that this cooperation is driven by the motivation of academics to benefit their research. Hence, it was important to have this narrative when we wanted to promote academic entrepreneurship, that it was good for your research, and not push them to another role that not many would like to play. And finally, we learned the importance of relationships. What happens when we try to keep promoting this academic entrepreneurship, the origins of entrepreneurship coming from universities? We need to cooperate, so we should not think too linear, but we should also ask, are we all or are they all playing along? If we see from this monitor, the multi-rank gender monitor published in 2022, we could see that in the blue side, we see the number of women, and in the orange uh, color, we see the number of men enrolled in higher education. We see that last year for the first time, this is international, women were, uh, there were more women in the graduates and undergraduates in higher education. So there are more women than men studying in higher education and graduating. The story changes as we move to scientific careers, uh, leadership positions at universities or leadership positions or seniority levels. The story changes tremendously. So we saw, okay, how would we, what are we going to do with all this potential that is not playing along when we want to transfer knowledge? In the same vein, we saw that or we see from the last year's uh, startup monitor, the situation in Germany. When it comes to the situation of uh, startups, we also see that only 20% of the ones that are found in uh, startups, meaning companies coming from the university or based on knowledge, only 20% are women. Most of the argument of why this is happening is that women make other choices. They attribute this difference to the women, but we don't think that this is an inclusive narrative. It's not only a matter of choice. 
If you see, for example, where is the venture capital going, even when women decide to study technical fields, even when women decide to found startups, there is exclusion or there is a lack of inclusion in the financial sphere. And maybe some of you have even read uh, the books from uh, Sheryl Sandberg, which was very well known about Lean In, which is saying that women don't make leadership positions because we don't lean in. But that is, in, that is not the complete picture. It seems like when we use these narratives on the choices of women, it's like if we would not have the ambition, but this is not true. The environment, the system, women don't need to be fixed to fit the system. That's what I want to say. The system has potential to include. And this is what we said there is actually um, still a need to bring more women into this scene. Just by the fact that there is a lot of potential when women play along in the knowledge that we produce in universities and the knowledge that will be transferred to the society, to the markets, okay? So I go to the next slide on the opportunity that we found. In the side of universities, more than 50% of the students and graduates from higher education are women. This is great. This mirrors international, this is also in Germany. And we see only around 20% of the startup founders being women. There is a lot of potential if we look at it from that perspective, and not only from the linear perspective of patents, licenses, startups. What we did is that we applied for a big grant in 2020, to bring research around inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystems, thinking we should change the view that women need a special education to fit a system. We should stop thinking that entrepreneurs are solo heroes. We should look at the system. We should look at the way we are educating and how is the environment supporting and hindering these processes. Because it's a matter of the system. It's not an individual effort. So we received one million grant to bring about this research. We also have documented all this research in a friendly format that is available online. And what we're trying to achieve with our project is working towards 100% inclusivity. Not only in gender, but structurally. Meaning that what we are, as we are teaching entrepreneurship in universities, we should really make sure that women are embedded in the ecosystem, that our teaching activities cross the boundaries of the university. That's what I put this map of our partners. You can see, for example, that we have Munster University of Applied Sciences, but the research has been carried with a non-academic partner that could be an incubator, an accelerator, or an innovation office. We replicated that in five regions. Why? Because if education changes and it's more inclusive, but the ecosystem, the incubators, they don't change, then when our students graduate, and want to found business, they will find a lack of inclusivity outside. That's why we needed to do it together and go beyond the boundaries of the university. We were looking at closing the gap where these 50%, let's say more than 50% of the graduates were, are women, that we close what we could call a valley of debt that they don't cross all the way to incubators or to accelerators. So we were working together with them based on our learnings that this cooperation is important from the first study that I showed you. We carried interviews, 365 interviews 
to understand the whole narrative around the system. So we were not researching only women entrepreneurs, we were looking at their environment from different perspectives. We interviewed educators, we interviewed entrepreneurs, students, alumni, program managers to understand the narrative around entrepreneurship in the ecosystems. Is it inclusive? Is it really such an exclusion? We also documented more than 25 entrepreneurial journeys from individual entrepreneurs, but to understand the whole journey and everyone that could play a role in this development. But we also documented that in a friendly way, as to use this as the cases with which we teach entrepreneurship. Why? Because we saw, and I won't go into all this uh, detail, but I will go back to this one. We saw, for example, in our interviews that the education of entrepreneurship is a lot based on unattainable role models, such as Elon Musk, Steve Jobs. Our students, especially women, couldn't relate to them. It was something somebody will do, but not me. But when we brought the case from Tricia, for example, which is a regional entrepreneur from your university, which was in your ecosystem and made a company, those are the cases we should be using to really have role models as part of education. These role models are documented in our website and a lot of other teaching materials to change to change the way we are talking about entrepreneurship. We have some of, uh, but I see it's a bit hard because of the colors, but I want to just close this uh, part on what we got from this research is that the ecosystem was not inclusive in the sense that the narrative around entrepreneurship was based on traditional values of profit, growth, Accelerators look for growth instead of sustainable, sustainable development. Um, our students want to become entrepreneurs because they want to create a great impact in the society. But they receive the information about profit, about growth again. And for example, uh, our educators, they couldn't mention many female role models to teach the role models they use are traditional and let's say a male dominated scene. Hard to appeal to our students. And to close this, we have developed a research agenda which we saw the narrative needs to change to be more inclusive, to appeal to women, but also to appeal to other faculties like the social sciences, the creatives, um, nursing. We need a lot of innovation in this field. We will benefit from having, for example, women that study nursing subjects, that they develop entrepreneurial competences, innovation. And this is what we want to achieve. On the one hand, we're looking at understanding more the role of context at the national and regional level. We have, uh, along the way, special issues, for example, to understand more opportunity-driven female entrepreneurship. A lot of the stories we hear on female entrepreneurship in emerging country in economies, it's around needs, it's around uh, going out of poverty. But the universities in emerging economies are doing great at founding startups based on knowledge. Okay, Mexico has great, great cases that we don't see in academic papers. We need to document that as well. We're looking at Tel Aviv as well, how the inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem works there. We're also not only talking about um, entrepreneurial, I see that my time is gone, so I close with these two slides. We're focusing on well-being of entrepreneurs as well not only profit, not only growth, not only number of unicorns, but the sustainability, the diversity in these ecosystems. 
We are also looking inside of organizations, how are we promoting innovation? And we are talking about failure in entrepreneurship. And finally, our project that will start in 2024. It's a cooperation with Ukraine. How can we foster the renaissance of societies, training the highly educated women that migrated to come back and through entrepreneurial behavior, build their societies back? Thank you very much. Dr. Rosano, thank you so much for your great presentation. Uh, please stay with us. And now I will, uh, before presenting Dr. Fer uh, Fernando Moya, I would like to welcome the, His Excellency, the Ambassador from IT. Very welcome to this embassy, Mr. Ambassador. So now we have our second speaker on this From Science to Startups uh, topic, Dr. Fernando Moya from the Tecnológico de Monterrey Campus Santa Fe from Mexico City, who will present solutions and technologies second to customer problems, jobs, and outcomes. Dr. Fernando Moya he uh, studied the Bachelor of Arts in Industrial Engineering at the Tecnológico de Monterrey and has a Master of Business Administration Corporate Finance from the State University of New York of Buffalo. And finally, a PhD in Business Administration with concentration in finance graduate with honors a long, not a long time ago. <laughs> Nowadays, he's an associate professor, consultant, entrepreneurship and innovation department chair from the Tecnológico de Monterrey. And among a lot of competences includes his teaching, financial analysis, consulting, client relations, speech, startups, strategic planning, team leadership, valuation, exchange rates, innovation management, among, among much more others. The floor is yours. Very thank welcome. You, thank you. Thank you. Very, thank you very much, all. Uh, it's an honor for me being here. Ambassador, thank you. Ambassador, your excellence, thank you very much for the invitation for all the staff. It is wonderful to, to fly all the way from Mexico, be here, uh, just sharing, sharing some ideas, so many things that we have, are doing in Mexico. I, I come from Tecla Monterrey. This is a private university, uh, specifically from the Graduate School of Management, a Gather Business School. And uh, uh, well, I always, when I hear the word innovation, I just want to get out of the room because it is sometimes misused. And uh, but uh, now we, I have, I, I brought you good, good news. And I call this presentation "Solutions at Technology Second. I'm sorry, I know that this is the science week, but second to customer problems, jobs, and outcomes. And uh, I was a little bit uh, worried uh, uh, about, uh, uh, can you, can, can you uh, give me the second slide? I think this is, uh, I don't know if I'm turning it on. Well, I, I was very worried to know if uh, some of our audience knew what this was. Hello? <laughs> So this is the nopal, I mean, and it's, it's a, uh, a cactus that, uh, believe it or not, but we, it's a wonderful food that we in Mexico uh, eat uh, frequently. Uh, I think this is the one. So, but there is a problem with, with the nopal. Uh, you know, they had thorns, big thorns that in order to, to you know, to uh, enjoy the wonders of the flavor of the cactus, we need to take them out. So we had a challenge. So a group of scientists, of physicists, mm -hmm, got together and uh, using quantum physics, uh, they came up for a solution. Uh, the challenge was to destroy the thorns of the nopal, of the cactus, you see? Mm, and uh, well, we came with this uh, with a solution. It was a laser, a laser to destroy the thorn of the nopal. Mm -hmm. And I give you, please, can you run the, the, can you play the video? I give you the, 
a wonderful uh, you know, <laughs> that destroys with a laser the thorn of the Nepal. First of all, we needed to, to scan where the, the thorn was, and then with the, 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 the perfect frequency, we shoot the, the, the thorn and destroy it without harming the first layer of the nopal, of the cactus. Mm -hmm. And this group of scientists came to me and said, Fernando, we need your help. Because we just discovered, they were atheists. They said, Fernando, God created the thorn of the nopal to be destroyed by laser. Well, it's good. Mm -hmm. So we start working. I mean, we had the, the patents, the machine, the finance, uh, everything was ready just to uh, conquer the world. So we worked, uh, can you give me the, the next slide? And they came to me and you're in business, you're in innovation, you know finance, so let's do a business plan. Mm -hmm. So after many months, we had the product, the patents, we went out and tried to sell this stuff. And uh, well, sales were like zero. <laughs> Lots of effort, lots of science, lots of quantum physics, many brains, a lot of budget from Conacit, <laughs> from Simvestap. This project was from Simvestap. Uh, but uh, we had zero sales. I'm going to get back. Why? Uh, well, that's the way that the, they were solving the problem of taking out the thorn of the nopal well, no, no, with no laser. Then I have another case. Uh, this is another, another case that I worked. This is the EduBot. This is a robot, very sophisticated robot using robotics mm -hmm, to help children to be educated. We, we developed this, uh, uh, and a colleague of mine developed this, this product, uh, this robot with voice and movement, educational games, math, English, Spanish, different apps, gaming. I mean, again, it was a wonderful, wonderful product. But at then, when we get out and, and try to sell, this uh, edu robot again sales equals zero. Mm -hmm. So there was a pretty little problem with the methodology that we were using when we were, you know, developing technology using science and lots of math with all these scientists with all these fancy uh, uh, titles, you know, degrees and PhDs, etc. There was a little problem about uh, what we were doing. Uh, I had a student that he's the, the director of uh, um, printers of uh, HP in Mexico, in Guadalajara. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can say, what's happening to the printers? Are, are we selling more printers or less printers? Well, this is the trend of printers in the world. It's going down. Who's printing right now? Mm -hmm. Well, not in income paper. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to talk again more about printers. But. Uh, now we have tools to make innovation a more predictable uh, process and not letting just our scientists just to develop and making patents and to see later on if, if it's going to be successful in the market. Fortunately, we now have, that we didn't have 30 years ago or 20 years ago, methodologies to and we, we use science in the innovation process. We use methodology that can, before even we start developing the product or the service that we're going to sell as entrepreneurs, we can have a very high degree of uh, probability to be successful in the market. Mm -hmm. So innovation, as I said, I, I just uh, get away from any conference that uh, is, uh, they mention the word because I, well, I didn't understand uh, before the, 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 the concept of innovation, but it is a top priority for, of nearly every company. Mm -hmm. I, I, as I was telling you, I worked with Carl Zeiss in an innovation projects. I worked uh, with Sanofi, with uh, Behringer, mm -hmm. uh, and, and many other companies that they put innovation as in their vision statement and, 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 and mission statements. But uh, an innovation, innovation is the, the best weapon for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We want to put, you know, uh, knowledge into our, our uh, startups. Mm -hmm. Not, as you mentioned, not survival entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So innovation is the best weapon for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I put a, a, a laser uh, on purpose in this, in this picture. 
Uh, well, Darth Vader might I might uh, misplace the, the picture of Darth Vader, but uh, so companies and startups they need look at this a new innovation mindset, mm -hmm. not letting innovation be just a random process, a new language of innovation, a new a new. Uh, um, uh, concept of innovation, a new definition of innovation, and a process that ties all the pieces together. The, the good news is that we, we are there. We are there. I've been in this business of teaching entrepreneurship and innovation for many years. 30, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> and uh, we were in the past cheerleaders. Okay, you entrepreneur, you can do it. Come on. But now I think we, we are getting more serious, and we have methodologies, and we have, we have a very strong language. As you heard in my CV, I mean, I, I come from finance, and uh, they have a very strong language, but innovation, entrepreneurship, we were very weak in, in, in the language, in the academic wording that we used when we were defending an idea. But that history, that is history. Uh, so we need a new mindset, a mindset that, uh, as Clay Christensen said, people don't just buy your product, they hire it to get a job done. Mm -hmm. To get a job done. All the products that you see here, the chair, your glasses, your tie, your, all the products, your, your, your watch, everything, all of these products are doing a job for you. There is a job to be done. And you hire those products and services to do a job for you. This microphone, the Zoom, the Zoom communication, this, uh, the screen, everything is doing a job for us. Even the chair where you're sitting is doing a job for you. And you fire it. You fire that service if, if, if they don't, are not delivering the, the, the correct and the, and the job that you're expecting as, as a customer. So, we usually, in science, my colleagues, uh, the physicists that were doing this uh, laser to destroy the cactus thorn, we usually first look at the, at the solution, from the solution lens perspective, from the product per per perspective, because we are scientists, we, that's what we do, that's what we know. But just to be done is a perspective, it's a, a lens, that allows innovators, aspiring innovators, to see the world from, from differently, and innovation differently. We want to see the world not from the drill. We don't want, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. We want a quarter inch hole. Mm -hmm. So innovation now, we have to shift and see and look at the quarter inch hole, not at the quarter inch drill. Mm -hmm. Printers is the drill. Mm -hmm. What do we want from a printer? I'll tell you later. So jobs, see, people buy products and services to get a job done. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is a job? To accomplish a task, to achieve a goal or an obje objective, to resolve or, or avoid the problem, to make progress in our life. So the job has to be a very clear statement with no ambiguity that is clear for the innovator and also it's clear for your customer, and your customer, if you ask, they will tell you. It's not true that, uh, oh, if I ask my customer what they want when driving, you know, horses, I want a faster horse. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, we will never develop all the automotive industry. <laughs> so, uh, job to be done is a unit of analysis on innovation. The job is a unit of analysis. And, uh, is a unit of analysis. This is hard for marketing guys. It's not the customer, not the product, not the pains, not the gains. This is more, more lean startup methodologies that are like becoming the standard for, for entrepreneurs and to start for startups and not the consumer behavior. Well, now what we have discovered, we analyze the job and make it the unit of analysis, then we can understand what customer wants and start developing now products and services that will win in the market. And I will guarantee in 85% perhaps or more of, uh, of, of, of winning products in the market. Mm -hmm. 
So what is the job to be done? For example, the job to be done in the cactus is just to eliminate the thorns. Mm -hmm. Now, the customers, when we uh, uh, write the statement of the job, we need also to know what are the outcomes of the job. And the problem with uh, you know, the laser destroyer of thorns was that customers wanted to minimize the time it takes to destroy and to eliminate the thorns. And believe me, the machine that did you look at the video was very slow <laughs> and they didn't want, even though it was a perfect uh, scientific technological uh, process to destroy the thorn. It was faster to do it with a knife. Mm -hmm. But what it, the need was, it was to minimize the time it took. And also, they want to minimize the cost. So that uh, quantum physics uh, development, uh, believe me, cost uh, a lot of costed a lot of money. Or, or in education, we want to pass on life lessons to children. That's the job. No one be waiting. Mm -hmm. And the robot, I mean, it was just a good to have, but it is not, was not a, where were you? I needed you. Mm -hmm. Where were you all this day, I, all this time? I need your, your robot to educate my, my children. Not at all. And the printer. Mm -hmm. The printer, we came with this uh, uh, statement with the HP, a, a, a HP executives. What is the job of the printer? Well, the job is to transform from digital into physical information. Wait, but isn't the world going the other way with digital transformation? Don't we want to just to go from physical to digital information? And there was a very nice statement, good to find, because uh, there are other types of, of uh, solutions for of to transforming from digital to physical information. I put here, uh, this is uh, the cartoon of my mom because she, she has a printer machine and it's very difficult for her to print. It's very expensive for her to print because the ink is very, very expensive. You have to you know, replace every, every, every now and then and it is very expensive. And the customers, they don't, they don't want that. What is the job of this product? Mm -hmm. Well, this is very interesting. I've done many workshops just around this product. What is the job to be done of toilet paper? I just uh, leave it like that. <laughs> so uh, jobs to be done uh, have nine, nine, nine tenets, and I'm just gonna, gonna outline uh, three of them. First of all, uh, people buy products and services to get a job done. Mm -hmm. uh, jobs are stable over time in all industries, uh, what, what changes is, are the solutions. But the job is stable over time, and also the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And the job to be done is solution agnostic. They will, the, they will not be loyal to one solution. They will be loyal to the best solution. And that's where innovation comes into play. Mm -hmm. Let's see solutions that are better than the last one, mm -hmm. or cheaper. Uh, and success comes from making the job the unit of analysis, rather than the product, the service, or even the customer. Mm -hmm. And we have done this in many industries, in finance, in, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, pound industry, you know, in, uh, in, in bread. In many, many, many industries we have tried the job to be done methodology and the outcome innovation outcome innovation method. So we want to tie it up together using the concept of job to be done. We want to apply science in the innovation process. And we have Tony Woolwick's uh, outcome-driven innovation methodology. Mm -hmm. I'm very close to the group. Uh, so outcome-driven innovation, and your driven innovation, right, university, I read it in your, in your slide. This is a strategy, an innovation process that ties cost customer-defined metrics, and that we call them desired outcomes, mm -hmm. and to the job to be done, making value creation and innovation measurable and predictable. And predictable. Our narrative as uh, professors on innovation and entrepreneurship is, are you going to fail? And you have to be resilient and go, go, go on and, and, and keep on trying. Come and go, pivot. That's like the standard in, 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 in teaching innovation and entrepreneurship. But now I think we have this methodology that uh, we can 
to make more predictable the, the result of a, of, a, of a product or a service. Mm -hmm. So uh, the steps of outcome-driven innovation, we define the market around the job to be done. That's why understanding jobs to be done is, is, is crucial. Then we uncover desired outcome. The desired outcome, we defined it as the customer needs. Because then we found out that if you talk to people, and what is a need for you, it might be a different thing for another one. So now we, we, can, we can have the same definition uh, of what a need is, and also what innovation is. And we quantify also the, the outcomes that are unmet. We discover se se uh, hidden segments of opportunity, and then we can deploy, formulate and deploy a winning strategy. Mm -hmm. And so we can conceptualize. For all that are in product development, we can conceptualize products, you know, with certainty that will win in the market before development begins. And we don't leave innovation to luck. We put science into the process. Mm -hmm. And that's outcome-driven innovation. Do you know this company, Bosch? Well, you know this product? You know, the circular saw? It was a home run in the market. What methodology, methodology they used? outcome-driven innovation, and that's a statement of, uh, of Jason Schickerling, the product manager of this, uh, uh, of the circular, circular so I have the study of all the outcomes that they defined and how then engineering, after we knew what customer wanted, they designed the circular, the circular saw. Mm -hmm. So from science to startup, mm -hmm. yes. We need first, Lean tells us that we need to discover the product market fit. And, uh, but it was very lousy. What is a product market fit? We have outcome-driven innovation to know what customer wants. And then in the next stage, we can apply our science and our technology when developing the product, product market fit. And then we go to the next stage, uh, the start of that, to, to discover that uh, if we have a, a, a business model fit. And this is, this is Lean. And this is some, some countries that uh, are, uh, we have an index, by the way, the Global Innovation Index. Uh, Mexico is there, uh, top three in Latin America. I won't say globally in what place we are. <laughs> and in Tec de Monterrey, we have uh, uh, programs, uh, entrepreneurship based on science and technology, but we don't only leave it like that. We make connections with scientists, entrepreneurs, and consultants and professors in order to uh, help scientists to connect with, with. So uh, there are some examples. This is an, an example of a spin-off from Tec de Monterrey. Remember the printing machines? Well, we're developing 3D printing machines of meat, for example. Mm -hmm. That's a very fascinating, fascinating uh, startup uh, by I mean, scientists that we are helping them to, to, to to really understand what is the job that they're helping uh, others. And this is Horizon Architecture from Edgar, a good friend. We're helping them to, to develop uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, system to help uh, companies, to help professors. I can even go there and write the, C uh, I can write the name of my class and with artificial intelligence, he can give me the syllabus, uh, exams, tests, etc. So. Some examples, and uh, so innovation. Again, Darth Vader with the laser is a process of devising products or service concept that addresses customers' unmet needs. We don't even define it uh, based on technology or science, but we need to address customers' unmet needs. Thank you, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for your lecture. Dr. Moya. And now we have a couple of minutes for questions and answers. So this is the time if you have some questions. Please. Yes, please. If you please can tell us your name and, and where you come. Hello, everybody. My name is Arkady Pilov. Um, I am from Academy. And my question is about uh, gender 
inequality in academics uh, close to my specialty and uh, as far as I understand you show data on Germany yeah when there is 50 50 at the university and then the rate of women decline to 20 percent in academics is it data from Germany No, I, I, I do not hear. Sure. <laughs> uh, what about Mexico? <laughs> okay. So the data uh, from the startup monitor in mm -hmm. the startup, that was uh, from the startup monitor in Germany, yes. Yeah. What about Mexico? Mexico? Yeah. So what yes. is the percentage of women at the university in Mexico? Do you know figures? Um, when we talk about Mexico, we see a higher percentage wow. of women yeah. um, starting business with entrepreneurial attitudes, uh, the, TC, the, the rate yeah. of uh, entrepreneurship by the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, Mexico, Chile, um, and other economies and where they are at the top yeah. on women's entrepreneurship. Yeah, and Arabic countries. In Muslim Arabic countries, countries exactly. The champions. Yeah. Yes, however, so, okay. So <laughs> this is my comment. Uh, you need not look for environment. Uh, so the, the problem is in biology of women. However, <laughs> however, um, the entrepreneurship that we see in these countries is not opportunity driven, meaning it's not based on science, it's not based on knowledge. And this is, we have great attitudes, but we don't have these companies, these startups mean based on knowledge, based on science. That's how they differentiate a startup in a, in a business. Or in, in, and this is what the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor also reports. This is why we have this special issue we're, we're preparing a special issue gathering research in emerging economies when it comes to opportunity driven because we don't know much about it. We just know that many of the uh, companies or ventures founded by women um, in these countries with high degree of attitudes in, in entrepreneurship, they are not knowledge based. And, and what was your comment that the yeah. problem is where? My, my, yeah, my, my comment yeah. is that this is so uh, biology yeah biology i mean they are not motivated uh, yeah, as, as much as uh, men i mean there are motivated women but uh, uh, percentage of men who are motivated to do science and but to, this is exactly to... what our i like that you bring this comment because this is exactly the narrative we see Women, you are the problem. <laughs> but we saw through our research, I have other backup slides, a woman with a PhD in seniority levels. You think they don't have ambition? You think they don't have the willingness to go for a company science-based? Okay. They do, but they are also facing an environment in many areas, but one of that area is the financing. If you see the number of female investors does not go above 15%. In one of my slides, I see how uh, the amount of money from venture capital has gone down to female founded business. If you want, if you want I can have it. But this is an issue for women. Number one, very few female investors and there are theories that said you invest in what you recognize. In certain years, for example, the investments for erectile dysfunction research went up because they recognized. And there is very few money flowing to menopause and menstruation symptoms and pain. Yeah? And this is a problem. Second, in our research in Tel Aviv, 
fantastic entrepreneurial attitude among women because um, they pass through military education and that helps them a lot in these technical abilities and, and knowledge. They said, when we have female investors invest, invest in my company, it's like a double-edged sword. That's the name of our publication, for example. If I receive a round of funding from a female investor, in my second round of funding, they say, you just got this investment because of your gender, because this female investor is backing you up. So I doubt that your startup is making it the second round. And this is what we are going with our research. We are shifting the view from the women, from the motivation, from this narrative that we lack self-confidence to the system, resource providers, networks. Another insight, if you may, if you let me just share, we saw a lot of female-only networks. Great for support, great for uh, going and, and showing sisterhood and, and support, very good. But they are isolating women from the ecosystem, especially in technical fields. You need resources that are in mixed networks. So there needs to be a balance. So I like that, that you tell me that, and this is what we want to challenge, and we need to bring the data on that. Thank you. Thank you. Another question, another comment? Or you have something to say more? Maybe? <laughs> I, I am part of, a, of the board of a microfinance institution, and we solely finance women, group of women, under solidarity. Um, but this is survival entrepreneurship, as, as, as you mentioned. And yes, indeed, the numbers in Latin America go up because of this survival entrepreneurship. And uh, we have discovered, and, and, and in the practice and also in research, that uh, women, when you lend, lend them money, they, they, they pay better, especially in, 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 in that, uh, that uh, segment. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I work with, uh, my research is oriented on, on that, on, on financing women, <laughs> but in the base of the pyramid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Now we will have a little break, 10 minutes only, please. And, uh, Hope you are enjoying this afternoon. Uh, don't go. There's much to learn today about robotics in medicine and humanities and at alternative futures. In 10 minutes, please.
we will start with the topic robotics in medicine. And I have the pleasure to present to you Professor Dr. Francisco Morales Serrano, who was born and raised in Mexico. He made his bachelor's degree at the Instituto Tecnológico de Monterrey in computer engineering, he has a master's degree in electrical engineering at the Stanford University and at the Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara, he also had um, a learning course together with the master's degree. He completed his doctoral thesis at the Institute of Electrical Machines at the Technical University of Berlin. After he worked for years in industry, like Hewlett-Packard, Continental Vehicle System, Philips, Berlin Hart, Oclutech, as a developer, researcher, project manager, group leader, department head, division manager, and managing director. He became a professor who is his passion, as he tells, and um, he likes to research, to, to solve complex problems with technology and to develop something that benefits people, for example, in medical technology. Uh, lately, in a, cup, a couple of years ago, he created, he created a specialized laboratory uh, in which he performs research in an interdisciplinary manner on the big challenge of autonomous surgery. We have the pleasure to hear his lecture today about robotics in medicine. Yours is the floor. Thank you, Thank you very much. His Excellency, uh, uh, Ambassador of Mexico and Germany, uh, Distinguished uh, Dr. Rojo, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about, uh, uh, as you said, uh, uh, my passion. Um, today, um, I'm going to share with you uh, um, th this field of research and some intermediate uh, results that uh, we are obtaining. I'm professor at uh, Berlin uh, Hochschule für Technik. And I don't work uh, by myself, of course. Um, I work with a lot of people, and this is the results of many people. Um, first of all, uh, about uh, robots. Robots are nothing else but a uh, so-called uh, kinematic chain of actuators. So you connect uh, one motor, put, uh, put an extension, and then you, uh, you add another motor and then an extension and another motor. That's a robot, nothing else, okay? Um, however, robots are uh, extremely precise machines, very interesting machines um, that are perfectly and very precisely described by mathematics. In, uh, in most of the applications, they are uh, used as a pick and place applications. So in a production line, they uh, very easily replace a human being by taking one thing, putting it in, in, the other, uh, in another place, or then just uh, fixing a screw or whatever, or uh, soldering, things like that. This is uh, just uh, two examples of what a robot can do. Take a, a cup of coffee, give it to a person, put it in the hands of a person, and, and that's it, without hurting that person. The other example is uh, by a, a now a Korean company uh, called uh, Boston Dynamics. Um, but before we move on this topic, I would like to ask you a question. Could you imagine that a machine performs a surgery on you autonomously? So the answer is no, or maybe, but not yes. Um, well, 
there are already robots. There are already machines performing surgery. This is just one example. This is an eye surgery to exchange the intraocular uh, lens. Uh, this is a femtosecond laser uh, performing cuts below the, the cornea and then performing a very precise cut. And then the physician inserts uh, a pincette and then extracts the loose uh, intraocular lens and then replace it with another lens and then closing that. That's possible nowadays, that happens nowadays. This is a very easy, uh, uh, I'm gonna say easy, because uh, it, it works just like a, a CNC machine, a computer a numerical uh, control machine that creates a new part as easy as that. It's very clear where these perforations have to happen and this machine does that very precisely with a laser, that's it. It's, there is no chances to, to move to the left, to the right. Uh, a human being cannot do that, by the way, so precisely. Um, so autonomous surgery, what is our vision on, on that? It's not about replacing a surgeon, okay? It's not about uh, science fiction picture. It's about assisting a surgeon. So it's not replacing. The surgeon still needs to plan the surgery very carefully. The surgeon still needs to decide what the therapy, the, the surgical therapy would have to be. What we believe in is a machine that assists the physician, okay? The physician says, please do this, and the machine will take care of that. And I'm very happy that our previous speaker was talking about uh, technology, well, not talking about technology uh, innovation and saying, why should we do this or why should we do that based on only technology uh, or science research? We did not agree on this slide, by the way. And I put a question here, why should we do autonomous surgery? Just because we can do it? That's not enough. That's by far not enough. Um, we believe that this would be necessary because there are some situations where a surgeon might require assistance. We, the world is larger than the Charité in Berlin where uh, the chef arts has uh, an assistant and the assistant has an assistant of the assistant and so on and so on. If you go to Brandenburg, there is a, actually a problem with uh, physicians. If you go to other countries, the situation will become worse and surgeons don't have the experience, the skills, the materials to achieve that. And thirdly, just to put it on, on the, 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 in, in, in that sequence, we have the situations where the fine motoric of the human body is not as precise of a machine. And in those situations, we believe that a machine can assist the surgeon, can help the surgeon. That's the reason for that. So, um, a little bit about the, the background of this topic. Two years ago, we installed a, a, a lab specialized for autonomous surgery. We removed the word robot uh, 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 of, of this uh, terminology because it is not about robots, it's about autonomous and surgery, okay? It's about assisting uh, again. And we installed these uh, two uh, six-joint uh, robots. They are actually very nice modern machines that uh, you, can, you can acquire for industrial applications. Um, we installed them in, 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 a, in a vertical wall uh, to make sure that we can replicate uh, actually a, uh, an operation table, uh, by the way, and that they can work together. We select as a first application um, among engineers, by the way, without any physicians, to perform a suture on, on a skin uh, wound. Um, why a skin wound? Well, it's a very uh, frequent uh, procedure. If you open a hole, then you need to close it, uh, of course. 
skin models you can buy everywhere. Um, and then uh, you need two collaborative hands with a high level of dextricity. Um, this is a, a recent publication two years ago from a research group in China where they started doing this, but only on simulations, um, this procedure of uh, suturing. There is also a, a huge research group in the States uh, performing the uh, um, suturing of uh, the in intestine uh, also um, with, with robots, but using a very specialized machine to perform the, uh, the sutures. Um, we decide to do this because of the following. Um, first of all, a, 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 a suture needle is, is a, a rigid uh, piece of metal that is very well described by mathematics. And um, we, can, we can use it, this model, and uh, think of this as being the tissue that you want to uh, put together, back again. Um, so, uh, first of all, we had to analyze this because there is no paper, no scientific paper, that describes how to make a suture. Um, I know that, uh, that uh, in, in medical school, you go to a workshop or things like that, and then you learn to perform a suture, but there is no step-by-step -step or sutures for dummies or for engineers, in this case, uh, so that you can learn that. So we had to understand, look at the movies and so on and so on, and see how you can do step-by-step -step a suture. Um, so first of all, you need to hover above the tissue that you want to suture. Then you need to purse uh, the, the one side with a very high um, acceleration. And then you need to strengthen, strengthen up uh, the needle because you need to continue and to bring the, 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 the two sides together and then pierce the other side and then rotate the needle and um, swap the hands. Well, we did this, we programmed uh, these two robots and we can see actually step by step uh, what uh, you can see, uh, what, uh, what we could achieve with that. Um, uh, the, the pictures are not as small, just that you cannot uh, see the, the mistakes. Uh, I, I'll show you in the big picture, uh, the movie, the knot turned to be a very simple procedure because a knot is very well described uh, by mathematics, uh, by topology. So I will not bother you with that. Uh, but let's say piercing the tissue and then moving and manipulating the needle that was a major challenge because it is not described in literature. So this is what you can see uh, here. This is, a, we introduced a, a needle um, consistently into the tissue and uh, this, this, uh, this crevice or this wound is actually one millimeter away. And then the one side is uh, roughly uh, five, uh, 500 uh, microns. And on the other side we program roughly 200 microns to bring the tissue together. And now, this is, the this is the critical moment of this presentation because I need to work very closely with Andrea. She will let the robot do their thing. Um, this is robot number one. They have also names and, oops. Um, this is the job that robot number one has to do. Uh, wait a second, and then Robert, robot number two is coming, aligning. Robot number two needs to pick the needle and then keep the rotation that, uh, that we had started and then pull the needle and then start with the knotting. So if you can advance, because this takes a long time and I want to bother you. So robot number two has the needle. He will grab it, the needle and then pull the needle we can go to the second, the, the next dot, Andrea, please. Exactly. Now we have the, the needle, the, the robot pulled the needle, and then he, the, the robot will advance and pull the, the thread of uh, the suture. And this is where robot one starts doing 
participating. As I told you, they, we need two collaborative uh, hands with a high degree of the, the, uh, dexterity. And if uh, we have a look at what next is, exactly. So we have now the, sec the, the, the first robot engaging um, in, and then the second robot will start to wind the thread around the, uh, um, the, 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 the needle holder of the other robot and so on and so on. Um, so we can skip to the next uh, point. Exactly. And then this robot would have to pick the, the thread. We are cheating in this moment because we missed that moment. Okay. And then the robot uh, engages the end of the thread and then pulls and then we have the knot. Okay. And that's it for the movie. Thank you very much. Uh, great job. Now um, we move to one comments because I can read your mind. And in your mind, I can see your faces saying it's too slow. It misses the thread once. It looks very traumatic and it is not smooth. And you are absolutely right with everything. You are right, okay? And we're working on all these four points right now as we're talking, okay? And I promise you the next time I'll show you better results or if you are in the emergency room and you need a suture, we will do it for you, okay? Um, let's, let's look at the next steps. What, what uh, have to be the, the next steps? So we need to solve the aforementioned problems and we're working on them, but this suturing is just a, it's just a game in itself. This is not the final application of autonomous surgery. Okay. What we need to do is work together with physicians and we have a collaboration right now with uh, one uh, surgeon from the musculoskeletal surgery department and um, with the medical informatics uh, department. Uh, we established already a collaboration and with them we will be choosing three procedures, real procedures where we can make a difference with robotics, okay? And what do we need to do? Well, we need to learn what is what the surgeon is doing. And then by means of artificial intelligence, try to mimic what the human is doing. This is, this is an extremely difficult part because we cannot uh, perform thousands of uh, surgeries and then ask the computer to learn from those uh, examples. We need to teach the, uh, the, the, the machine actually what, what is the task to be done and not learn from examples. And that's very difficult for artificial intelligence, but we're working on that so that the robot will be mimicking what the surgeon would do. But next to that, it needs to adapt that the learnings to the situation that is on the table. No human body is the same. Okay, so we need to be doing mimicking and adapting at the same time. So we need also to introduce motion tracking because the human body is moving slowly, but it's moving. And we need to be, a, uh, to, 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 to be capable of tracking these very tiny movements so that the robots can follow that. Track and, 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 and perform the procedure, but, um, but still do it precisely while the organ is moving. And then, um, of course, we need to work with uh, better surgical instruments. Um, what would be the outlook of this? Well, uh, doing research on big problems, 
you, it's like opening a, a can of worms. You understand uh, something, you solve one problem, but you discover new problems. And this is what happened with, uh, here. We need to work on natural movements. Uh, they need to be smooth. Then we need to work on, on the man-machine interface. Can you imagine that the surgeon is doing very important and then he needs to leave the patient to this table and then move with the mouse and sign something that would be impossible. That's not the way to do. We need to work on an interface that is, that is realistic for the setting. We need to work on ethics. We need to understand what is, what is behind this, what is ethical and what is not. Um, we need to work on safety systems and strategies. How, how would the system react when a major event happens? We also need to check what would be the patient perception. I mean, in this audience, nobody said, I volunteer to be the first patient of this. So uh, there is a lot of work to be done on patient perception. Uh, we also need to link the system with the so-called PAX uh, system of uh, the hospital. And together with surgeons, we need to develop new surgical procedures. Um, having said that, I thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I hope you don't need something like that ever, but wouldn't it be great if that would be available and somebody needs it? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Dr. Morales Serrano, you probably raised a lot of questions. I'm as a doctor, I don't know what to, to ask, but I think this is a great opportunity uh, for some surgical procedures that need very exact movements, like the one you show for the, for the eyes in ophthalmology. <laughs> among others probably, but probably too expensive. Or? Um, I work at the university, everything is for free. Uh, <laughs> um, well, look, look um, if, if we look at the, the commercial available systems, which are not autonomous, but they are what we call telemanipulators. So the surgeon is behind a console and moving joysticks, they are roughly 1.5 to million euros. That's way too expensive. I totally agree. And that doesn't have to be like that, okay? Um, these robots, uh, they cost uh, 20,000 uh, euros each. Uh, the question is, how can you create a complete system that is safe, um, that has the right... Uh, the right uh, in, uh, surgical instruments. And yes, it will not be cheap, but it doesn't have to be that expensive. Yeah. Somebody has another question? Yes, yes. Only, oh, Ambassador. I'm, I'm sorry? I keep asking myself a lot of questions about robotic surgery. Yes. I heard about it. But I used to work in the countryside for long, maybe 20 years in my life. And I remember a special case. She was a very young patient. She has fever. Maybe I think it was malaria or maybe meningitis. I don't know. But she fell in coma. It was really embarrassing. So I tried to doing some research in up-to-date books from uh, Yale University. They told me, in this case, sometime, the optic nerves was compressed. No, any chance to have uh, the eyes again. But by referring to a very old book written in, in the 40s, in the 50s, the French people, the French doctors, is at this moment I understand the role of clinic 
in medicine, clinical examination. And they told you, there is no blindness. There is only some stasis of the blood in the people. Attack with cortisone. In three days, the young girl recovered his eyes. It was amazing. So I was very reluctant regarding the. Uh, I asked myself if I really. Uh, medicine is something of reflection and examination, patience. So I still keep myself asking a lot of questions about this, the future of the medicine. I can imagine, and I understand. I understand you. Um, one of the physicians uh, uh, we work with, um, uh, uh, Doctor Bach, he he used to work for the German army, and he said, "Look, when I work in a big hospital, I have everything behind me." Um, you, you were talking about the, 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 the situation where you were very far away from a big city, yeah. a lot of infrastructure. Yeah. Well, that is exactly what he was describing. Uh, he said, um, look, if I work in Berlin, I only perform certain, certain surgeries. I never do this, I never do that. I only do this, but when I'm far away, as in the case uh, you were describing, well, in that case, you are a surgeon for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where he said, that cannot be. It's too complex. It's too difficult. Yeah. And uh, he, he is in it, uh, in this project, uh, because he also believes that surgeons need somebody, a machine, maybe. Uh, they, uh, the best would be a person, but a machine could also help. In, in places that are far away from big cities, from big uh, hospitals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I understand. Yeah. I still stuck, stuck yeah. to, me, to oh, traditional medicine. It's very, because my teachers used to tell me there is no medicine without reflection, yeah. without thinking. Yeah, absolutely. We are not replacing the surgeon. <laughs> The surgeon is the most important part. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Now, I was wondering after your presentation that uh, about the applications of the, of the robot. You know, during the pandemic, one of the bottlenecks was the taking of samples. Mm -hmm. And do you foresee that that be something that the, the robot could could done that, that taking samples or swaps, and also will be safer for the first responders to to not get into uh, into these new uh, pandem pandemics or new viruses? I don't know if you yeah. think that will be one of the future uses. I never thought about that. I think that that's a great idea because um, um, basically so taking samples maybe a blood sample that's uh, what uh, what do you think what do you mean um well looking with infrared uh, light uh, through the skin is very easy it's uh, it's stand of uh, it's a uh, it's not uh, not science fiction it's very normal and you can find actually the veins very easily with infrared uh, light and it would be very easy to, um, well, you need to fixate an arm and then uh, introduce a, a needle. Uh, I never thought about that. Uh, thanks uh, for your inspiration. I, uh, I will, uh, we will think about that for sure. Also for swaps. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask you because First, it was mentioned that uh, these machines, these robots are helping for precision, which is yes. really important for surgery. But if you can share with us what was the initial goals of creating this, because as you also mentioned that uh, to operate in perhaps super far away uh, towns or cities, and what was the inspiration behind all of this project in the beginning? Well, um, very simple. It, it is actually what uh, you would call in innovation technology push. Uh, that's, that's the way we call it. Somebody has an idea and, and there is no problem about that. 
but you have an idea and you want to push it uh, through uh, through against the wall uh, to do something. Um, and that was the origin of that. I myself, I spent many, many years at industry, um, especially in the area of uh, research and development of medical devices. And then when I came to the university, I started working with robotics. And I tried to find actually a, uh, the, the, the union between my experience at industry and the union of the, the, the academic research that I'm, I was supposed to do. And I found that that would be a very interesting part. And I started actually uh, developing some ideas, developing some visions, and, and then talking to people. Uh, the list of that, that you saw, why should we do this? It doesn't come from me, to be honest. It comes actually from physicians that I spoke to because they said, well, if we could have this, then we could solve this problem. If we could have that, then uh, we could solve the other problems. Um, Dr. Rojo uh, just mentioned about uh, ophthalmology. Um, there are other very precise uh, uh, procedures, removal of uh, some uh, tumors in, in the in, for uh, in neurology, uh, where you need to be very, very precise, uh, that that could be another another application. The original application was based on. I have a, I have some experience on this, and I know about this. How do I bring that together? That was, not not very elegant, uh, <laughs> but that's that's uh, the origin. Yes. We have already robotics in some uh, specialties, like Professor Serran Morales Serrano said. Neurology is one of the most important, and cardiology yes. also. Ca you know better than I, because you yeah. have to do with Tilo, cardiologic Tilo. Yes. medical devices and ophthalmology, among others. And the, it, it is a, a great help for surgeons that are very, very experimented, but that they need some help in very precisely points of the body, like the brain, for instance. Yes, there is another question over here. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and thanks to sure. the organizers for making this event happen. Um, I have a, maybe it's a technical question, but maybe it's a conceptual question. You touched on it a little bit when you were talking about mimicry and, and adaptation, because my understanding of AI and robots is they're very good at thinking with the information bases they have, but they're not very good, if we use the word thinking, they're not very good at thinking about what they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that would be important in this context when we think about the variability of the human body. Um, and medicine historically has struggled with its idea of like the normal human body and the abnormal human body and the abnormal human body has always been a racialized gender gendered body and so on so i'm wondering to what extent the the capacity for a surgeon to make a decision based on human variability could be applied to these technologies to what extent can these things work with stuff that might not be part of their data sets if that makes any sense. Yes, definitely. In, in, and I think that, uh, that you're touching a very, very exciting uh, uh, point of uh, artificial intelligence. We as uh, human beings are extremely good at generalization. So we see the picture of one person and then we find this person in, uh, in, 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 in a group of 10 persons very quickly. And then if we see the picture again, then we will find the person among 100 people. Um, this is very difficult in what the, the, the uh, uh, traditional artificial intelligence that is based on supervised learning. Uh, do, do, do you know that uh, term? Which is where you back annotate the cases and you say, well, this is a dog, this is a cat. There is an in internet, uh, a lot of uh, challenges how, how good your, your AI uh, algorithm are uh, in order to, find, to distinguish between cats and dogs. I mean, it's 
I'm sorry for for the example, but it, it is it is as it is. Uh, maybe useless uh, a useless uh, game in internet, but nevertheless, uh, people are trying to do that. But all this data is annotated, and there are thousands of pictures of cats and dogs. We cannot create that here, and therefore, I'm working together with my colleagues on, on another paradigm of uh, of, uh, of artificial intelligence, which is. Uh, it, it's called uh, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is actually the, the more human natural way of learning, which is about trial and error. So you, you get a task and you need to try it. And then you get a reward or a punishment, just as in life. Um, and then you try better, you try better, you try better until you achieve mastery. Now, of course, you cannot put talking about ophthalmology, put uh, uh, thousands of eyes and then check uh, which one gets good. Um, the good part of it is we can create models and then send uh, these models to, to, to reinforcement learning and then it will be learning to get its way through, its correct way through, okay? Um, so having a model of something, it's great. So that will solve the problem of mimicry, not the problem of adaptation. The problem of adaptation is maybe the most complicated one because, well, once you see the crevice of, of a wound, now you need to decide, uh, should, I, should I pierce um, 200 microns or 500 microns away without tearing away the, the tissue? for instance. And that is something where we need to go back to the amount of experience from physicians. Um, I believe that the mimicry can be solved uh, with, with uh, reinforcement learning, but adapting, that will be a major challenge. It is a challenge, yeah. But that's what I mentioned. You open a can and then you discover, oh my God, there are more problems. Okay, we'll, we'll be working on that. Yes. The chance to your last question, please. Thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Uh, my question is also very re related to that. Uh, you said about uh, perception, but you don't have a lot of data. So in the autonomous driving and all, they, they are looking at this where you have small data like something like transfer learning approaches, or you only look once to recognize whether it's a cat or a dog. Yeah. You don't need 10,000 samples. How, how about in, the, in, in such a very precise surgical procedure? The, 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 the example of autonomous uh, driving, it's a, it's a perfect example. There are uh, Thank you. thousands of hours of annotated movies about real sceneries of cars driving around, okay? Where, um, believe it or not, you send this uh, to uh, far, far, Asia, far East Asia, and then there are companies that annotate uh, the movies. Uh, that's a human being, and that's not a human being, and that's a human being, and so on and so on. And they annotate the, the time in the movie and then the shape of the person and so on and so on. So um, you can shift all these movies through this uh, supervised uh, learning algorithms and then they will be trained. So in a way you have thousands, thousands and thousands of movies. We cannot do that uh, here. Uh, we don't have that. Um, if we would, uh, let's say, train something just for one surgery, then, well, we would need to do uh, 10 years of movies uh, and then annotate them, and, well, we all would be very old by then. What you do here is, uh, as I mentioned before, you create models, geometrical models, and, or morphological models, um, and you, the, you need to decide the trajectory of what needs to happen. Uh, surgeons are great at cutting, uh, sewing, 
and removing um, and then taking decisions, of course. Um, and so you need to you need to be able to describe these trajectories that they need to that, that the robot needs to learn and very precisely. And then with vision, you can tell you can, you can work on the adaptation of those models. That would be my my guess. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So we keep moving now with another extremely different topic. Humanities and alternative futures. And I have the pleasure to present Dr. Lasse Hölk. Dr. Lasse Hölk studied history, philosophy, and ancient America research, and then has an, uh, included one semester in the University of Sevilla. And after that, he makes a research visit in the General Archives of India in Sevilla. And uh, he, makes, uh, he made a master in a uh, title, among others, Islam pictures from Spaniards in South Asia. Lately, actually, he is um, making a research study at, in a postdoc at the Institute for Latin American Studies from the Freie Universität from Berlin and especially in this project that he is going to present, uh, whose title is um, the International Research Training Group, Temporalities of the Future. The floor is yours, Dr. Howard. Thank you very much. Now to something completely different, as you said. Uh, Your Excellency Francisco Quiroga, Ambassador of Mexico, thank you very much for your invitation, especially to you also, Dr. Jojo Medina. I'm very honored uh, to present briefly our international research training group, Temporalities of Future, Dynamics of Aspirations and Anticipations in Latin America. Together with my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Jean-Francois Proudhon, the director of the Colegio de Mexico, he will continue just after my speech. The International Research Training Group was established in May 2019 to introduce a new and multi-perspective approach to uh, the research on time as a fundamental category of human meaning and um, action. Funded by the German Research Foundation, DFG, and the Consejo Nacional de Humanidades, Ciencias y Tecnología, uh, three groups of 12 PhD students from Germany and Latin America employed for three years and supervised by 10 participating scholars in Germany and 10 scholars in Mexico to investigate the temporalities of the future in regard to Latin America. The IRGG has established close cooperation in doctoral studies and research between Freie Universität Berlin, Humboldt Universität zu Berlin, and the University of Potsdam here in Germany, with three of Mexico's most renowned research institutions, El Colegio de México, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and the Centro de Investigaciones de Estudios Superiores de Antropología Social. Almost 15 years ago, in 2009, we started out with a research program called Between Spaces, focusing, obviously, on spatial constellations. Uh, since 2019, the follow-up project on temporalities of future in Latin America has ensured that our master and PhD students, the postdocs, professors, and also other staff can continue to meet regularly and conduct research together on an equal footing. This year, the IRTG has been successfully evaluated and we were granted its extension for a second phase, which, which started just last week on Wednesday, the 1st of November. An excerpt from the very positive appraisal by the evaluators reads as follows, I'm citing. A particular added value of the program is the continuous exchange of Mexican and German scientists 
and doctoral candidates, which offers the opportunity for training in both countries and also enables the formation of international networks. Both the solidarity of and scientific exchange among the international group of doctoral students have been particularly impressive. The communication between PhD students from both countries works perfectly in both directions. That's us. The IRTG is dedicated to research in a unique interdisciplinary and international constellation in which sociology, history, cultural and social anthropology, literature and cultural studies, economics and political science in Mexico and Germany work together. Our interdisciplinary focus is expanded by scholars from educational studies, gender studies, and religious studies. Generally, the academic profiles of the IRTG members are shaped by the different national academic traditions and disciplinary settings. And therefore, they have different foundations even within one discipline. Uh, on the basis of the IRTG, we have established a profound academic exchange and lively research environment in the past years. Look at the people. Since the relaxation of pandemic travel regulations, which hit us very hard in early 2020, as everybody else, these contacts have been transferred back into in-person meetings, as, for example, during an opening conference with our Mexican partners in Berlin in June 2022 and our recent summer school 2023 in Mexico City, which took place at all three of our partner institutions in Mexico City. Through the Mexican-German cooperation in doctoral training, we can take advantage of the strength of two different systems of doctoral studies. On one hand, the IITG doctoral studies program combines the strong research orientation, individual scope and personal supervisory relationships of the German doctoral tradition with a balanced study program and systematic mentoring by the group, which is based on the decades of experience of structured doctoral studies at Mexican universities. Advising and binational teams of supervisors, the integration of a research day at the partner institutions, as well as research and fieldwork trips to Latin America and Berlin, make the doctoral studies program of the IRTG unique in Germany. The IRTG implements a study program that supports the doctoral candidates in the best possible way in the realization of their research, uh, and thanks to a year-long feedback process. It enables an efficient doctoral process as well as imparting higher level skills and knowledge for a successful career in and also beyond academia. We part from an assumption that the future is produced by actors and is thus a social and cultural construction. Temporalities of future are what humans create to make sense of the times to come. They are framed by their aspirations and anticipations, which become visible in everyday social practices and performances according to the actors' cultural backgrounds and the existing temporal orders. The perception of time and the future is, on the one hand, subject to historical change when viewed diachronically. On the other hand, time is explored in its resulting diversity in the form of temporalities that also include subaltern and non-Western ideas. Of, and ways of acting in relation to the future. For example, indigenous concepts of time and temporalities have been investigated so far primarily in regard to their view of the past in regard to, for example, calendrical systems. Inferences about a cyclical conception of time were thus taken from these traditions intended to emphasize a relative backward so static or motionless idea of temporalities among indigenous groups in comparison to the West's own understanding of itself as dynamic and progressive. Only very recently has attention been given to the imminent concern for the future, as expressed, for example, in the rituals, in the rituals for the Aztec goddess Siuacuatl, the snake woman, as the great mother of the future generation. As our comparisons between Mexico, South America, as well as the historical Philippines show, the idea of linear reckoning of time is challenged by many indigenous societies, so this anticipation of a constant renewal of the relationships among individuals, groups, and the nature that surrounds them. In intercultural uh, communications, then, 
Western European linear notions of past, present, and future are frequently turned upside down. We start out from the assumption that all forms of interaction are essentially characterized and driven by certain notions and visions of the future. Even when actors struggle over different interpretations of the past, even when they quarrel about social conditions and measures to reform them, it is always and naturally the future that they are fighting for. Mexico is not only a research location, but also a thematic focus of the IITG. As a hub between different worlds, Mexico, maybe more than any other place, has stimulated and produced conflicting projections and actions of the future. We are asking questions about the country's role as a center of future visions for Latin America and other world regions. Mexico's historical developments since early modern times have had a great impact throughout Latin America and beyond. Beginning with its role as a global silver supplier, center of the Spanish colonial empire, to the Mexican revolution of the early 20th century, which as a forward look and experience inspired the left all over the world. Mexico's ever-changing relationships with the neighboring United States serve other countries as a pointer to a future of participation or also non-participation in a world characterized by an increasingly unequal distribution of wealth. The study of our PhD fellow, Ricardo Uribe, on the introduction of mechanical clocks and the implementation of the Gregorian calendar in the Americas shows that the first steps toward a global synchrony and universal time were taken through the Iberian expansion in the world. Our postdoc fellow, Jose Francisco Hernández Reyes, addressed in his award-winning PhD thesis the aspirations of social prestige and material wealth that drove Arabic-speaking communities throughout the world to leave the place of origin in order to make America as a concretized utopia placed between the temporalities of a present time where uncertainty and permanent farewell predominate and the future reality completely different but promising to be conquerable and adaptable to their aspirations. In trying to understand different temporalities of the future in Latin America, our researchers look at the overlapping and interacting concepts of the future stemming from different regions of the world. Our research program, therefore, focuses on aspirations and anticipations of people in Latin America. In our conception, aspirations refer to the process of actively ushering in the future, for example, projects of conquest and colonization, the establishment of educational systems, or revolutionary movements. The term anticipations, in turn, denotes a reaction to possible future developments and a way of coping with contingency, for example, preparations for natural catastrophes, demographic developments, adaptation to or negation of modernization. The resulting dynamics between aspirations and anticipations guide us to investigate the different protagonists' projections of the time to come and the historical and social processes determining the practices to shape the future. In the research area of protagonists of the future, we focus on who are the central actors the individuals, groups, and institutions who play an active role in articulating and shaping future practices and visions. Today, centers of future research exist in many Latin American states. Building a network of academic and non-academic thinkers and futurists who try to develop prospects and strategies for the improvement of economy and society. Using the example of Nicaragua, the work of our PhD student and political scientist Luis Clichia Navas shows that abstract political entities such as the state play decisive roles in mobili as mobilizing forces, defining temporalities of other abstract entities such as the youth, and are at the same time dependent on the expectations of these mobilized collectives. Elisabeth Gayon Droste has just submitted her ethnographic research on how different actors unite in giving voice to the overexploited Atrato River in Colombia's Chocó region. As a single protagonist made up of media and heterogeneous human collectives living along its shore, the river speaks out 
for Sustainable Future and has been recognized recently as a subject of rights by the Constitutional Court of Colombia. The focus in the research area of projections into the future is on political visions, fantasies, dreams, literary and artistic utopias and dystopias that have been created in Latin America in certain times and societies. It explores the reasons why some of them were able to spread, while others were forgotten, and how projections of the future involved culturally and socially heterogeneous populations. Our literary studies scholars remind us that thinking about the future always implies necessarily fictive narratives that enhance the aspirational capacities of people through the empowering function of language and to communicate anticipations of the time to come. Literary ideologies generated regional Latin American projections like Arielismo, christened in José Enrique Rodo's essay Ariel from 1900, which was dedicated to the youth of America. This trend purposely provided instructions on how to build a better Iberian culture in Latin America in opposition to US materialism that went on to become highly influential in cultural production and anti-imperialist movements. Eva Kilmes' ongoing ethnographic, ethnographic work in the rural Andean region on female Quechua farmers is dealing with the challenges and contradictions resulting from a simultaneously anticipated climate change and an aspiration for collective continuance. Our third research area focuses on the social and cultural processes that influence hopes and expectations of actors in Latin America. It examines how these processes bring different temporalities into contact, how they interact or conflict with the hegemonic temporal order. The process of securitization, for example, has in many Latin American cities led to a technological arms race. One emblematic example is the pilot project Detecta, a new big data policing tool currently implemented in Sao Paulo's wealthy district, Morumbi. The efforts connected with Detecta aim at anticipating future criminal acts and crime prevention. Education, as another core function of the state, has crystallized as an essential process that conditions thinking about the future, enabling the anticipations in the first place and forming aspirations later on. Bringing together the hitherto unrelated research strands on either educational or migration aspirations, Mexico-based researcher Montserrat Young Solis hints at the processual, uh, processual character of the formation of aspirations itself. In Berlin, Pia Berkhoff is researching the perspectives of migrant families on the temporal discrepancies throughout their journey to the United States as temporalities of transit asking how migrants anticipate their future and how their future aspirations change when they are forced to wait for several months at the border. Given our successful and fruitful cooperation between Mexico and German universities and institutions, as well as and above all Mexican and German scholars, we are looking forward to continuing our joint venture for the coming years. I am specifically looking forward to the next visit of our Mexican partners in Berlin in July 2024 uh, to discuss our empirical and theoretical results and the state of progress on the various projects. At that time, I will also be able to meet again my dear colleague Jean-Francois Proudhon, who will now continue to present the IRTG from a specific as a chief speaker of the Mexican side and director of the distinguished Colegio de Mexico, our main partner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hölk. We will continue with uh, Professor uh, Jean-Francois Coudon now. I will present him and, and after his uh, presentation we will have a couple of minutes to make some questions. So um, Professor Jean-Francois Coudon 
studied political sciences at the University of Montreal. He has a master's degree in political science also in the University of Montreal. And uh, then he had studies in international relations at the Institute d'Etudes Politiques à Paris and a PhD in political science at uh, York University in Toronto. His lines of research are opposition political parties and the articulation of interests in Mexico, comparative politic, politics, political parties and institutions in Mexico and Latin America, political theory, citizenship, and political presentation. His teaching experience started in 1984. He has been a professor of the following institutions, Colegio de Mexico, already mentioned, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico, the Faculty of Latin American Sciences, Social Sciences, Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económica, CIDE, Instituto de Investigaciones, José María Morelos, Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana de Iztapalapa, el Colegio de la Frontera Norte, el Colegio de Sonora, Universidad Iberoamericana, Universidad de Montreal, y los Institutos de Estudios Políticos de París, y actualmente dirige el Colegio de México y el proyecto de Temporalidades del Futuro, que ya mencionó el doctor Hulk. Um, you are already listening to us, so Professor Udion, the floor is yours. Excuse me, he, he will talk about Future Temporalities, 15 Years of Mexican-German Collaboration. Bien. Okay, well, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, Dr. Julieta Rojo. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to see you again, even if it's uh, from a distance. Uh, German and Mexican colleagues, so I would like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I think it's a great initiative. It's not the first time that I participate into those uh, Mexican-German uh, science days. And uh, I found the uh, presentation of my colleagues uh, very, very interesting. Uh, Lassie has already given us a, a general introduction to the project. So what I will do uh, will be to talk about the project from the uh, from a Mexican perspective. As it was said before, its antecedents go back to 2007, when we first started to explore the possibility of academic collaboration between a consortium of German and Mexican university so with the uh, creation of an international research training group involving the participation of both academics and graduate students interested in exploring a common um, and universal research topic. At the time, the uh, IRTG program was a new program that was part of the uh, uh, strategy of internationalization of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Mexico, as it was said before, the participating institutions were the uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, the Center for Research and Higher Education in Social Anthropology, CSAS, and El Colegio de Mexico. Uh, let me make a brief correction to the presentation of my CV that has been done by, uh, by Dr. Rojo and my colleague, uh, Lasse Holk. I'm not the director of the Colegio de Mexico, I'm just the director of the Center for International Studies at El Colegio de Mexico. So in 2009, and it lasted uh, until 2018, we were granted financial support by the uh, DFG and its uh, Mexican equivalent, the uh, National Research Council for Science and Technology, CONACYT, to develop an inter 
Interdisciplinary International Training Group, IRTG, on the uh, spatial dimension of social phenomena under the title of Between Spaces. Basically, the idea is that uh, we were looking, it was uh, very important for us to create a binational and transdisciplinary academic community interested in the study of a fundamental academic, uh, fundamental topic that crosses many disciplines of the humanities and the social sciences. And we decided to work on the sp spatial dimension of the uh, social processes because it's, uh, it's an implicit and always present dimension of the social relations. Social relations and social processes tend to build on the existence of a spatial and a time dimension. So it was very uh, interest, important for us to create a binational and transdisciplinary academic community interested in the study of that spatial dimension. In a certain way, transdisciplinarity was a new experience for us, the participating researchers on the Mexican side of the project. In Europe and in Germany, it's much more common that you find a kind of convergence from this different disciplines in the uh, scientific world. Mexico, I guess that I can say that it was at the time a very, very novel experience. And it ended up being a very fruitful and stimulating uh, intellectual experience. We also, as it has been said before, we also benefited for the, uh, from the convergence of two different um, graduate studies traditions. The Mexican model of a highly structured graduate programs with an important course load and elements of the German model of independent research. Basically, what we tried to do was to find a middle ground between those two traditions. It was also very interesting to establish a more horizontal academic relation with the graduate students from both Mexico and Germany through continuous group activities within and between our two national communities. What we tried to create and reproduce was the spirit of those uh, international research training groups. We also learned a lot about the national respective public policies of support to higher education and scientific research. Sometimes it is a challenge to find paths of administrative convergence to support efforts of binational collaboration. With the passing of time, I tend to think that we managed quite well to make the Mexican and German respective scientific policies mutually uh, beneficial. Our first experience, the Between Spaces project, lasted almost nine years with very, very good results. More than 70 MA and PhD students uh, graduated from German and the Mexican programs, 10 books were published as well as a dozen of or dozens of academic articles. So taking advantage of our <coughs> first collaborative ex experience in 2017, we decided to address another great universal topic of the humanities and social sciences, the temporal dimension of social processes. So this is when we started to develop our temporalities of future in Latin America, dynamics of aspiration and anticipation project. The first phase of the project was approved in 2018 
and it was reconducted in 2022. Uh, as uh, Lasse mentioned before, our research program examines the temporalities of the future with regard to Latin America as an exemplary setting marked by a strong, by strong power asymmetries and social inequalities and characterized by a very peculiar cultural heterogeneity. We understand time as a social construction and assume that the future is produced by actors in the form of aspirations, aspiration expectations, uh, projections into the future, formulation of utopian projects, the one side, aspirations and anticipations, which uh, uh, come to uh, try to see how to, pre to prevent uh, adverse, adverse conditions or to face contingency in the future. Our approach focuses on the encounter, encounter and interweaving of different temporalities of the future in the company. We are interested in different everyday practices, long-term projections, as I was saying, and the hopes and fears linked to them. And we also try to contribute to the uh, decentering current discourses on historical and contemporary conceptions of the future. We are trying to go beyond the uh, linear conceptions and evolutive conceptions of time. So Lassie already presented the three general axes that uh, the three general axes that uh, structure our project. Basically, it tries to answer the following question. First, protagonists of the future, who were and who are the protagonists defining the future? Basically, we address here the question of the role of the actors and agency in the uh, formulation of uh, visions of the future. Second element has to do with projections of the future. In what do they consist? What are the basic elements of the utopia and dystopia about the future? And finally, we look also look at the processes that affect the future, e.g. how underlying processes influence aspirations and anticipations of the future. Basically, we are interested there in the role of all the uh, structural elements that are conditioning the visions of the future. Okay, so how does the project work on the Mexican side? Well, around 20 researchers from our three institutions, UNAM, CSAS, and CONMEX, uh, are participating in the program. Regarding the students, our joint qualification program includes training in a study program that promotes international mobility and knowledge exchange. It supports students, 10 plus one, 10 graduate students and one postgraduate student from existing high quality graduate programs at UNAM, CSAS and CONMEX. Those students are selected through an annual call for applications and all of them already have received CONACYT scholarships. Once admitted, they all participated in an international colloquium, which ensures a continuous, continuous monthly exchange between researchers and graduate uh, students from Mexico and Germany. These Mexican students also have the possibility to realize a, a research stay, a fellowship in Germany, so it depends, you know, between one and six months, depending on their research interest. And so they have the possibility to realize a research stay 
in Germany in order to work with our German colleagues and their fellow students. We also received German students from the IRTG in our Mexican institutions. Both of the programs colloquia foster the permanent integration of the young researchers from both sides of the collaboration. Indeed, over the years, we have created a virtual community of students who graduated in the IRTG, and we try to, through the organization of many activities, to maintain the communication among us all. Every year, we organize summer schools alternatively in Berlin and in Mexico City, where the students from both countries present their, present their research advances and discuss them with the whole community. We also organize academic seminars and conferences uh, and participate jointly in international academic congresses. So uh, it's important also to mention that in the case of the German um, PhD program, uh, the students are the, the tutorship of the, the, the thesis, the dissertation of the students are assumed by one Mexican and one German colleague. So what are the results of the temporalities project until now? Well, despite the very restrictive conditions due to the 2020-2021 pandemics, we have had very good results. We have been able to maintain our basic activities through online uh, meetings to summer schools during the pandemics. And a year and a half ago, we went back to presential meetings when it was possible. At this moment, in Mexico, 15 of our students already finished their thesis and dissertations. And actually, there are two collective books that are in the process of being published at the El Colegio de Mexico uh, Press under the title of Temporalidades del Futuro, Temporalities of the Future, Debates, Textos, Generaciones y Educación, Debates, Text, Generations, and Education, and Temporalidades del Futuro, Lo Colonial, Lo Posible, y Lo Político. Y quizás, quizás como último, digamos, último punto que quisiera eh, resaltar es el hecho de que a lo largo de los años hemos logrado constituir una comunidad amplia de colaboración entre, in, uh, sorry, a community of, yes. Over the years, we've been able to, uh, to build a, a very interesting community of, uh, based on the collaboration between researchers and graduate students from Mexico and researchers and graduate students from Germany. And uh, I've already mentioned some of the academic results, which are fundamental. It's the, uh, basically it's the, the objective of the project, but we have also learned a lot from uh, mutu mutually on the German and Mexican side, we have learned a lot from how to build a, an institutional collaboration between two uh, distant countries with different cultures and different public policies when it comes to uh, the support of uh, scientific and academic activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Prudhomme. Uh, I would like to know if you have any questions for Dr. Kölk. Can you please join us? And, or to Professor Prudhomme. Somebody has a question? Ambassador, please.
Thank you. Um, I, I, I would love to, to, to learn if there is any uh, specific scenario, future scenario that particularly excites you or concerns you in, as a result of all this work that it has been so thoroughly described, like one aspiration, anticipation that creates a scenario that for you is particularly good or bad, exciting or worrisome. No, okay. Um, very particular uh, question. Uh, from what I learned uh, through the last years about alternative futures, which we are search among, in my case, certainly, among forager groups, indigenous groups, and anything. I have a, now, uh, if I have a particular concern, my answer would be, I think I would, uh, I am actually very concerned about that we are looking at, for example, topics like climate change, that we would put too much uh, confidence in scientific progress as a very uh, topic of the day and belief and reclining, believing that the scientists will invent us some airplanes that go across the globe without polluting anything or that they that we can continue to eat meat because the scientists will invent a cow which does not uh, produce any methane um, uh, outputs. So I believe, and what I learned from uh, very much smaller groups, even if it is in a way maybe um, also very ideological, is that we have uh, as a society and as individual persons we have to um, modest our consume in any case and we uh, must convince the people and talk about this without uh, simply uh, believing in a eternal progress which will lead us as Elon Musk uh, tries to tell us to, to populate some other planets in the galaxy. So that is a particular concern and a belief that I would like to share. Uh, yes, if I may. Yes, sir, of course. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, well, maybe maybe I would like to, to make a few precisions about the the, uh, the project. It is not necessary a project based on prospective of the future, on, on not only on the uh, prospective aspect of the future not from this time being. So. What interests us is to look at the time dimension that is present in all the social relations, be it 200 or 200 years ago, or right now at this moment. So that would be the first precision. The second, second, second element I would like to stress the fact that we realize, we already knew that, but we are realizing the, the, the fact that, that time is not, you know, like continuous, uh, evol evolutive, and uh, unilinear. You know, there are many conceptions of time that uh, uh, intermingle, you know, at any given moment of history. That's why we try to disentangle in a certain way. And finally, looking at the future, what I would say when I look at the, at the uh, thesis uh, projects of, the, of dissertation, project of the, the students, what we find is that even if we're not uh, working on uh, perspective, most of the topics have to do with very, very important and worrying problems of this moment. Give you three examples, for example. Uh, first, uh, and Lasse already mentioned it, 
the fact that uh, uh, people are very uh, students and we are also very worried about the uh, sustainable development, about what's happening in terms of climate, climate change and what are the consequences of climate change. Another example has to do with something that we lived, we went through very, very recently uh, under this. The low of contingency. You know, all those perpetual phenomena that we knew that could happen, but we were not really prepared to face those uh, natural catastrophes. So that's another issue. Other topics like, uh, for example, migration. In there are, you know, many students who are not are now working on the topic of migration, be it in, I don't know, between the Middle East or Africa to towards Europe, or what's happening right now in the Americas, you know, like people migrating to Central America and Mexico in order to eventually uh, be able to get into the US. And I will mention a last topic, which is called the imagination of demos and the uh, digital public sphere, which refers basically on how social media have affected the way uh, uh, public opinion is created in different countries. So basically the idea is that, is that students and we also as researchers tend to, are not necessarily thinking, thinking in terms of a big scenario for the future, but at the same time, uh, all the, the problems that we are living right now are affecting a lot our uh, way of uh, conceiving the future. So that would be my answer to your question, Ambassador. Any other question? I, I, I would like to, to make also a question. Uh, there's no doubt of the production of so many thesis of PhD students and master degree. And uh, uh, there's no doubt that there is a lot of academic exchange, but I would like to know if the results of all these studies that you have been doing during five years have any impact in decisions, political decisions, social decisions, behavior of humanity. Where are you going through your research in the coming other five years? Uh, what have you learned or is this impacting somehow? I don't know. Lasse first. <laughs> <laughs> I consider the impact of the disciplines we have is very low, um, but it is our task, of course, to to make a, to, to reach a higher visibility for, uh, that our findings uh, even the, for the implications of our findings. But this is still the far way to go. We have uh, um, the we had to wait until our project was. Uh, um, successfully approved so to, to make uh, the next step in the plan and for the next uh, summer we uh, we have planned to concretize our theoretical results and uh, to join together the empirical foundations of that to make an empirical saturated theory building um, but uh, we must see how far this is reaching into the wider society what we do not pro can make any particular innovations that will be sold somewhere. No, the, the uh, economic uh, usability of our research is also very low. Um, we cannot sell that. What, uh, what, what we can produce, and we do that on a large, uh, on a large scope, is uh, very well educated people with a high 
very high intercultural competence. And that is the, in the way that production that we must sell and that we can also boast with. And that's what we are doing actually like today. Thank you. So much, Professor. Yes. 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 Sorry. Can I can I say a few? <laughs> Just a, well, the it's a very good question. It's a very good question, but I think that it's a question that applies to all the, uh, the impact of the research, research activities in humanities and social sciences. So it's not policy oriented. But I think that in a certain way we contribute and by publishing the results of our research, we are contributing to a slow change in the uh, mentalities and the way that people see the future and the way that people see the, those aspirations and anticipations of the future. Um, I can tell, for example, that the, 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 the research that has been done in this project and the fields of education and in the field of migrations, international migration, may have an interesting impact on public policy decisions. Just to give an example, maybe I could give other examples, but I think that in these two cases, there is a public policy uh, uh, outcome or implication in the, the results of those uh, research. Oh, there are more questions. <laughs> yes, please. Um, thank you for the presentations. I'm, um, I was very happy to hear about all the different uh, cultural uh, studies that are being done. And, um, migration, in my, in my opinion, kind of is like a, um, is kind of part of globalization. And globalization mm -hmm. is kind of a, uh, makes everything more equal. On the other hand, uh, cultural backgrounds and the different views give the opportunity maybe to find other solutions and I was wondering if there have been any uh, or if there are any research projects that are focusing on that. Who's answering? Well, yeah, I, I don't know. Lassie, would you like to answer first or should I go? Well, as I mentioned, we have several projects focusing on migration. Um, I, I think I mentioned most of all, yeah. what I mentioned was actually the migrational uh, projects. I cannot um, now make a statement, uh, a very clear statement on your particular question if these certain aspects of migration will be considered, but I'm very sure that since we have uh, several investigators from different disciplines as in Mexico as well in Germany, that uh, they will consider these things as well. Yes, for example, we are producing empirical evidence and research on those communities of people from Cuba, Haiti, uh, Venezuela, also South uh, Central American countries like uh, Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, you know, those groups of migrants who are transiting to through Mexico and very frequently for different reasons, they end up staying in Mexico for a long time before being able to get a, a visa a refugee access to the United States or before being deported to their countries. So we have a lot of uh, empirical uh, material on this topic, for example, just to give you an example. So yes, we are contributing to, uh, to find evidence and information on new phenomena that are uh, occurring, uh, taking place in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Americas. Mr. Ambassador, thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Prudent, uh, yes. given the fact that in the 70s, a book written by Alvin Toffler in the yeah. US about future shock. Uh -huh. Do you believe in the, right now we can master this bit, we can make it friendly or dreadful? Let us think about the future, really, in terms of uh, 
yeah. human, human condition. Okay, I, 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 there was a, a little problem of communication. I didn't hear uh, very well your question. Uh, yeah, I am. A, I'm thinking about the future. Yeah. The, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Given the fact yeah. that yeah. there exists some years ago a kind of future shock for yeah. Western societies. Do you believe yeah. that time we can master this future, the future coming given the climate yeah. change? Yes, it's a very good question. I think that we are less optimistic than uh, we were uh, maybe what, uh, 50 years ago, 50 years ago regarding the future. There was, uh, at the time, there was uh, an idea of a positive evolution towards the future. There was also the idea that it was that with the, the growth of scientific knowledge, we would be more able to face uh, the uh, negative aspects of the future. Now, you know, and if we look back at the very recent experience that we had with pandemics, uh, we have learned that in spite of all the progresses of the science, uh, in spite of all those advances or progresses, uh, uh, very often we are not prepared to face what we call contingency. The idea that very often there are things that happen, natural phenomenon, or I don't know, you know, like wars, for example, you know, that uh, tend to uh, to put to a test our our to put our uh, capacity of facing the future to test, you know? So, so, and it's another thing that I think is very important as a, the out, as a result from the project is the fact that, uh, is the fact that uh, the time is not linear very often you know, it consists of a mix of, you know, like going forward and then going backward. Or, you know, living situations where we see that time becomes a little bit circular. So we end up, you know, having the impression that, uh, I don't know, 2000, looking at the situation in Europe right now, or of the past uh, few years in Europe, you know, very often, we have the impression that we're going back to the 1930s. So basically the idea is to look at how, you know, things tend to go forward and backward and how it mixed up, you know? So that would be my, my answer to your question if I, if I listen well to what you were saying. I don't know if it gives you an answer to your preoccupation. He cannot hear. He cannot hear you because you don't have the microphone. No. Oh, no, no, it's open. <laughs> the microphone is open. What if uh, uh, history repeat itself? As yeah. a historian, I can assure you history never repeats itself, but I, <laughs> I imagine what your concerns are, but this will not happen, certainly. Well. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Uh, there is a very last question, please, Dr. Moya, before we, we close. Okay. Thank you and, and congratulations. I, I really uh, enjoy the presentation. And uh, myself, I work uh, with companies on future thinking. I will looking forward to, to read the, the book that is uh, going to be one of the outcomes. And I think it's more deeper than just uh, uh, educating in multicultural, you know, uh, yeah. aspects of both uh, countries. I think there is, you have something in your hands that is very, very deep and very useful and practical uh, for companies. Mm -hmm. the, 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 we, we, even in, in, in Tech de Monterrey, we have a, an Institute of the Future of Education, but in <laughs> innovation department, we, we try to imagine what is the future of retail more specifically in companies, what is the future of food? What is the future of uh, finance? What is the future of education, of course? 
but uh, I think that there is uh, lots of things and lots of outcomes, very practical outcomes that I'm pretty <laughs> sure that you have in hand. But uh, if you connect them with with industries, uh, I'm pretty sure that you will have a you, you will have an echo, you know, in, in 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 with them, and and you can even have a revenue stream <laughs> on, on, on that regard. Mm -hmm. Thank you and congratulations. Yes, thank you, Dr. Moya. Uh, yes, well, it's a transdisciplinary project, but basically we are limited to the uh, traditional social sciences and uh, humanities, but it would be a very good idea to expand the field of our transdisciplinary collaboration to other fields of scientific uh, activities. And, uh, and uh, yes, and the other thing is that, yes, you're right, that would be interesting to try to prepare materials that would be of use for different social and economic actors. Yes. So thank you for your advice. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming this day. We expect to receive you next year on the 7th Mexican Science Day. Congratulations and thank you to all of the speakers from very high level. Thank you for joining us in this sixth edition of the Mexican Science Day. And thank you to all the equipment from the embassy, leading by our ambassador, Francisco Quiroga, for making this possible every year. Thank you very much to everybody. We invite you to have a glass of wine with us and to make networking. Thank you. Thank you.